You're listening to Food Trucks in Babylon, a Western Seminary podcast with Dr. Todd Miles and Dr. Patrick Schreiner. Listen as they discuss matters of faith, theology, and culture in a post-Christian world. Hey, this is Patrick. And this is Todd. Well, today uh, we have some people that are not going to be foreigners to anyone who listens to our uh, podcast. We have Tim and John from the Bible Project. Hey there. Uh, so welcome, guys. Hi. You guys got to come up, what, 10 minutes from your studio? Yeah. yeah. Come Just up with down us the road. and see our yes, studio. So. That's exactly right. Yeah. Thanks for being here with us. We yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having us. It is great to be here. I, I went to school on the campus of... Western Seminary, but I've never been in this particular room. This room, this is a very yeah. special room. Mm. It's a very, <laughs> it's like <laughs> in the upper <laughs> floor of yes. the back door. Exactly. This, anyway, so yeah. Yeah. this is great where the magic here. happens, yeah. right here. Yeah. <laughs> and Tim, you've been teaching at Western for how long? Yeah. Uh, you went to Western, and then I you, did. now you're teaching for uh, I think when I was still finishing my dissertation, I started even coming out to do oh, summer nice. classes Good. adjunct. I don't know. I guess that's 10 years. 10 years. I can't okay. believe that. that okay. That's true. Nice. Yeah. nice. What years yeah. were you a student here? Um, from 2000 to 2001. Okay. 2000, no, no, excuse me. From 2001 to 2003. Okay, the exact years I wasn't here. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah was, that's right, because yeah. we didn't overlap, but I remember your name coming up mm-hmm. because when the interviews yeah. process yeah. began. That's right, I'm Tom. terrible at those years in terms of when I was in school because it never ends, it feels it's like. Just <laughs> <I was in> <laughs> <school>. <laughs> totally. And, and John, <clears throat> when, when was the first Bible Project video released? 2014. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That that matches with at least my memory, which yeah. is good because my memory is not <laughs> always very good. But I came here in 2014. Oh, did and you? here's my story about your first video. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so I came here in 2014, started teaching. I saw the first video, Heaven and Earth, right? Yeah. Yes. Is that the first video? Good memory. And I did my dissertation actually oh. on kind of that theme. Yes, you did. And I was right. very upset and very happy. <laughs> <laughs> you all summarized my whole dissertation in like <laughs> five minutes. Yeah. So I would like explain True. it in Matthew, uh, did just in Matthew and like spatial kingdom stuff. Yeah, uh-huh. right. And people after my class would be like, so it's basically the Bible project video. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, thanks guys. And I was like cursing your names. No, uh, just kidding. No, it's really great. helpful. That's but, right. uh, and they gave you a PhD for it. That's right. <laughs> they did. Not, not I, for the I video. Didn't get one. <laughs> yeah, I, Hey, Southern might give you a PhD for that. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. If anyone wants to, I'll, I'll take one. Yeah. <laughs> and so maybe, I mean, I want, we want to get into kind of the topic mm-hmm. we're going to go over, but can you just tell me why you did that video first? Was there any reason mm-hmm. um, that that one came first? Because I, I, I spent so much time in kind of that theme as well that I thought it was so neat that you all started there. Mm-hmm. But is there a reason mm-hmm. you all started there? Yeah. Do you the, remember? I do remember. Uh, so when we talked about doing this project, uh, I wanted to just make theology videos and thought it'd be fun to do with Tim because I love having conversations about the Bible with Tim. And when we started talking about this and Tim was like, yeah, I'm in, let's do this. Then he brought a spreadsheet of like a hundred (laughs) videos, like already, like these are the ones I want to make. And most of those were just books of the Bible. Books of the Bible. We'll do one on Genesis. We'll do one on Exodus. But then there was 20 to 25, what what you call themes. Mm -hmm. And then you organize the themes based off of what book it would be good mm. to then also develop that theme mm-hmm. or think about that theme. So heaven and earth w- was connected to Genesis. Not right. Matthew. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Both, but yeah uh, I could. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's connected. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah. that was all the thought that went into it was that would yeah. be good. And I think you Experience. had built up a long list of questions about uh, the cosmology of mm. the Bible and the biblical yep. world and heaven and earth and hell and how those all Relate. It's a very visual theme too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I guess you guys are making everything visual, but we, it we is did. Very we didn't have a fixed process yet mm-hmm. for how we go about writing and making the videos. So we talked for a very long time, right? Weeks and weeks and weeks. And this was before we recorded our conversations. Yes, that's right. So those first conversations are were not recorded. Mm. That's right. 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 Yeah. So you you guys have the podcast too, and how long? Sorry, now I'm going in, into history. We're going to yeah. get to that topic, but maybe in 2015 at some point we started yeah. doing that. Oh, so that was pretty early on. It was early. Okay, yeah. I didn't yeah. realize that. I thought that was later on for some reason. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I think maybe our third or fourth theme video is the 
the law. Mm-hmm. And that's, oh, yeah, and that was our first that's when we turned on the microphone. That's when we turned nice. on the microphone. Yeah. 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 That's there you been go. A huge, I we, think a huge benefit uh, to see kind of behind the scenes and walking A surprising, the yeah, a surprising benefit for the organization because mm. uh, we got to have those conversations regardless. Right. And uh, it wasn't actually that hard to turn on a microphone. Yeah, just do it live. And because we already were doing them. You just got to cut out all the bad words. Yeah. 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 Or all the ums well, and ahs. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. yeah, cursing yeah. me out. Yeah, we always <laughs> take that out. <laughs> uh, no, joking. Uh, yeah, So, but, but people really love listening in. So Yeah, yeah. that's great. Well, today we thought we'd talk about um, kind of mm-hmm. your journey of reading the Bible, both of you. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the way we've titled it, or at least I've titled it in my mind, is kind of paradigm shifts and mm. how you've read the Bible mm. um, kind of throughout your journey of reading the Bible. So mm. getting behind why you're looking at the Bible in this way, mm. um, why you read the Bible in, in the way that you do. Mm. And I think mm. it could be helpful as yeah. pastors listen in and people hear um, these videos are becoming so influential for how people read the Bible and mm. just to kind of hear the almost... Um, uh, is this like yeah. the apocalyptic peeling back the curtain of <laughs> Tim right. and John? That's right. What um, makes what makes Tim and John Tim and John? Right. Uh. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so just kind of <laughs> hearing like big influences that you've had. Yes. Um, yeah. Things that have kind of stuck in your mind in terms of, uh, yeah, like this shifted everything with how I viewed the Bible. I think we can all identify at least a few moments. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Where it's like, oh, like everything clicked when I read this book or I met this person. Yep. And so uh, maybe I can start with John. Yeah, John, I think wanna... I should start because mine's pretty simple. <laughs> I, I grew up in, uh, in faith in an evangelical Christian church. and um, Large or small? Uh, medium. Okay. I think okay. maybe 500 people. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I always, I just grew up with this respect for the Bible and this desire to understand it. Um, and then I went, I went and studied at Multnomah University. Um, and so that was, that was a stream I was in. Um, a lot of systematic theology. Um, and uh, what ended up happening, I'm a very curious person. I'm constantly asking questions. In fact, growing up in my church, I asked too many questions. Like people, my parents... People in the church were just kind of like, slow down. Um, and uh, I was I felt like there was a limit to how curious you could be as a Christian. Uh-huh. Um, and so after college, I really started to just put it to the side and just decide, um, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm, I'm down with Jesus. But the Bible seems like a like a speed bump in the whole mm. the whole Jesus thing. Um, it's actually making following Jesus harder. Um, I come, w- I come with questions. I leave with more questions. I come with some anxiety. I leave with more anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I was doing that kind of not even very consciously, but mm. at the same time, mm. um, Tim and I had a relationship. We both went to undergrad together and, and you continued to go through school and our f- wives are friends and we were friends. And so we'd have conversations about the Bible and that would re kind of spark mm. this curiosity and um, and while having those conversations really felt like I could ask any question mm-hmm. and we could go deep. Mm-hmm. Um, so on one hand, I was kind of becoming this post-Bible Christian. On the other hand, I still had, you know, a bit of a, a pilot light mm-hmm. on, mm-hmm. Um, ready, ready to go. So my influence has mainly been now for the last, um, has it been six, seven years mm-hmm. of the Bible Project? And before that, just our conversations has really, has really been... Tim. Okay. Um, and I'm not really a, a, a big reader. Um, and so mm. I just kind of, I've just been learning <laughs> from dialogue. <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. Has you, been fun. you have an insatiable appetite for content. Yes. Yeah. You're constantly intaking content. Yes. Right. I it, listen to it, a lot of stuff. Yeah, I do yeah. read. Yeah. But I don't, I don't have a big stack of theology books I'm trying yeah. to get through right yeah. now. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It's true. Yeah. I think it's true for a lot of people. <clears throat> now. Yeah. There's so many forms of media. Yeah. Right. To, to learn. Yeah. You don't have and to read anymore. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Do, so can you I identify... I feel like it's a great hack. I yeah, just yeah. get to like yeah. let Tim do the work. Yeah. And <laughs> what about like in terms of... Um, like in terms of as you started making the Bible... Um, what, the Bible book overviews, whatever you... Mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. know what you call those. But yeah. was that... 
how you had read before, like with literary structure being such a big part of it or no. And well, we both learned from Ray Lubeck at Multnomah. I was going to say, it sounds like his Mm -hmm. fingerprints are all over this. Yeah. 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 So intro to, to studying the Bible, Bible study methods. And, uh, it didn't stick for me the way I think it stuck for Tim. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I really have learned that through our conversations. Um, there's the bi- the biggest, the <clears throat> there's been a couple big shifts for me. And one is that um, I grew up in a Christian environment culture where the Bible is so important, so much authority that um, it, it was not okay to talk about the human characteristic of the Bible. Mm. Uh, so if you started talking about the literary design of a book, yeah. like when we started or talking about o- that, or what the author intended, what the yeah. author was intending to do, mm. yeah. it just like made me uncomfortable because in my tradition, the, the Bible's not human. The yeah. Bible is divine. Yeah. Right. And to make it human, it's going to just fall apart. Right. And um, it introduces historical questions we can't answer, so forth and so on, maybe even. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just kind of opens this Pandora's box. And so that way of talking about the Bible was Mm. uncomfortable at first. Mm. And I had to really wrestle with that because the truth is, and I think even anyone in my tradition would agree that the Bible is both human and divine. And that's the orthodox view. But yeah. there was just... And dis- it has been for a long time. It has been yeah. for a long time. Yeah. Okay. Right. This isn't like a reason thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. But there was just this discomfort yeah. Yeah. of, uh, and like, if we could just polish off all the f- human fingerprints, it's safer. Yeah. Um, and and then you have like a pure divine word at that yeah. point or right. something. That's right. There's a sense in which we, typically there's like a doctrine that stands behind, which is historical and true and people have thought about it but then it gets shifted and molded mm-hmm. in different ways and different emphases mm-hmm. pop up mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. things start to get distorted mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and yeah it's just interesting to watch mm-hmm. doctrines kind of yeah. develop and yeah. grow in yeah. that way yeah. Yeah. yeah so what i found was that uh whenever i would see that the human th- part of the bible it, it would be scandalous right and that yeah. would frustrate me yeah um but then when we just kind of dove in and we're just like, let's look at this as literature. Like you'd almost look at any piece of literature. Now it's Jewish literature, so it has unique things from other types of literature. Um, but let's look at it and unpack it. And what I found was by approaching it in its humanity, the divinity really leaked out mm-hmm. in new ways mm-hmm. that were surprising and really exciting mm. yeah. Um, mm-hmm. that there's so much sophistication to the literary structure of the Bible. And then it just starts screaming of something more than just being merely human. Mm. Yeah. That, that human part of the Bible is the reason we do hermeneutics. It's yes. why we do yeah. uh, Bible study methods, things like yeah. that. Right. Yeah. Because it was, if it were just a divine book dropped out of the sky, we would, we wouldn't Understand need to it. think about <laughs> historical cultural context. We wouldn't need to think about yeah. literary genres or anything like right. that. Right, yeah. 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 Absolutely. And it's interesting how all of that can be masked for us when you're reading the Bible in translation. Yeah, right. And you've only known it in one translation. Because that yeah. itself, someone has already done an enormous amount yep. of cultural homework. That's right. To yep. make the Bible accessible to us in mm-hmm. whatever language you happen to yeah. be reading it in, but that's mm-hmm. that's like becomes a blind spot yep. for us. We don't realize that's happened. Yeah, um, it's been helpful as you, uh, Tim, just watching your work, mm-hmm. bringing up more of the original language to just kind of I mm-hmm. think sometimes it's just to shake us out of mm-hmm. kind of the mm-hmm. biblish that we get into or the Christianese that yes. we get into. Yeah, yeah. Just to kind of put a new um, word on it to yep. yeah help us rethink some of these things and I find that really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so what um what what John is pr- processing right there is uh, so I didn't grow up reading the Bible mm-hmm. um or being forced to read it or anything. <clears throat> so I, I mean I'm like a um, 19 almost 20 when I start following Jesus and I it's brand new. Like I maybe knew that there was somebody named Noah and Moses <laughs> but I didn't couldn't tell you what order. I mean, I didn't know anything. Yeah, right. So it was fresh. And so, I, you know, within that first year, I'm signing up for classes and uh, taking the Bible as literature at Multnomah. And mm. Bible so you come methods. to Christ and you go straight to Bible school. Yeah, it's within the first year oh. because I had all my other peers uh, were taking classes there too okay. nice. at the ministry at the skate park where mm-hmm. I started following <laughs> Jesus. So, uh, and so 
I'm learning how to read it and reading it for the first time. Uh, and so Ray Lubeck was a professor there, but he was also really mediating the legacy of a towering Hebrew Bible scholar, John Salehammer, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. um, who taught at TED and, and Bethel <laughs> for many years. And Everywhere. And Everywhere. Even, South, South, <laughs> yeah. even at Western. Gate and even at Western, Western for a couple right. of years. Well, yeah. that's yeah. exactly right. So yeah. uh, and essentially it's, it's a paradigm where it's in, it has an orthodox conviction about the human and divine inspiration of the scriptures, uh, but that the they it's this is exquisitely crafted literature. Mm-hmm. It's a highly nuanced form of communication in, through the style of ancient Israelite and Second Temple Jewish scribes, and so that was my f- that was my introduction. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't yeah. even say it was a paradigm shift. Yeah, that it's just was just what the you paradigm came into. Yeah, yeah, and which so was a paradigm shift in that scholarly world. Oh, so for sure. Yeah. It, as I came to discover. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Because yeah. Yeah. Uh, I didn't understand why. So right. I was introduced to the book of Psalms right. as an intentionally structured Canonical. collection of yeah. 150. There's actually all these thematic mm. arcs and design patterns yeah. and things that connect. And all, there's an argument. There's a theological argument right. that's advanced through the book. So that's how I learned to read this literature. And so, uh, so there you go. That's just how yeah. I've been. And to me, it was like all of a sudden, once I was given the skills and mm-hmm. the tools to learn how to read it, it was just every day. Mm. I was just like, mm. oh, my gosh, I can't. Yeah, I'm actually hearing yep. a voice that's not my own here. Right. Somebody's talking to me here. Yeah. So anyway, that was my, I would call that like the literary paradigm. And that has been with me in its influenced yeah. uh, the bio project and our, our conversations. Yeah. Were, were you guys into about. literature beforehand? Uh, like, did you no. No. like <laughs> English literature, British literature? Any? Mm. No, no. no. Okay. Comic book? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. No, no literature. Oh, comic books, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Comic <laughs> books, <laughs> graphic novels. Okay, okay. No. great. No, no co- for me, college was the first time I actually okay. started reading books and writing down what I was learning. <laughs> <on the books. laughs> I think so that's supposed to start in high there school. There wasn't a natural <laughs> affinity <laughs> to no, like literature, <laughs> literary structure, <laughs> anything behind that. Uh, I well, I am really drawn to story. Yeah, um, but I didn't study it. Yeah, um, and nor do, have I read a lot of of good fiction. Um, but um, and, and yeah, I didn't study in college. I and I will say that uh, it's I've remarked a couple of times, and over and over, I think about this: how strange it is that um, as part of our spiritual tradition that um, we are students of a book. Um, it mm-hmm. feels strange to me mm-hmm. because why a book? Why not, you know, you could, yeah. you could be geeky about a lot of things, right? <laughs> we could be really into botany or we could really be into, uh, and it's Portland, you could be into yeah. homebrewing or <laughs> yeah. all sorts of things. But, um, and, uh, but to to be mm. nerdy about these yeah. ancient texts yeah. as part of um, our faith tradition yeah. mm. um, in order to understand ourselves in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it is a pretty niche kind of thing. It mm. is. Studying yeah. literature isn't super yeah. niche. Mm. You know, literature is pretty important to the human condition. Mm-hmm. But but ancient Jewish literature, yeah. Yeah. like it's and a pretty it, niche topic. And it's actually <laughs> more unique. I read Larry Hurtado on this mm. where oh, he talks about right. yes. if you compare even ancient Near Eastern religions, as we call them, mm-hmm. that Judaism itself was a very bookish, I that's love that right. term, yeah. bookish yeah. religion. Yeah. Right. So that's we, right. we take it for granted kind of in terms yeah. of like religion is centered around books. Yeah, so That was actually a very Jewish Christian idea, which was that's right. really eye-opening to me because you just... Yes. You're in this culture and you just assume it and it's like, okay, mm-hmm. this is what everybody does. They study yeah. literature, they study books. Mm-hmm. No, no, that was something that, yes. I mean, I think there's a theology behind it in terms of word and communication. Oh, yeah. But just to see that that was actually unique for that time and how the Christians were the ones who yeah. really took the codex yeah. rather mm-hmm. than the scroll and mm-hmm. ran with it. And, and it's just fascinating yes. to think about. Yeah, yeah we, c- we come from that tradition. That's yeah, exactly. exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, that for me became the, uh, my next paradigm. Uh, shift was um, I was just ravenously reading the Bible and just loving it and learning so much. Um, and then again, in my peer group, I think one of my friends took Greek and he started telling us how incredible it was to be mm-hmm. able to like read the Bible in Greek. And 
then I signed up for Greek with three more friends. And nice. uh, notice the pattern here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we were all skateboarders. Yeah. And uh, so then uh, the whole issues of text criticism, canon formation, mm. the manuscript history of the Bible, uh, I discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, started reading the Septuagint, mm. comparing New Testament quotes to their Old Testament sources, yeah. and did the Pandora's box exploded on me. And that kind of set the, my next agenda for the next many, many years yeah. into dissertation research. Right. Um, you did, but you're, but you're still ahead. probably taking Sailhammer. Mm -hmm. his, yes. His like, Sailhammer uh, gave me that, a framework to that, that fit inspired all that. editor. Yes, type that's right. Person. Yeah. So that became really formative. That um, we actually can know quite a bit about the formation processes of the biblical texts. This is not terrifying. It's actually thrilling. But it's very different than mm -hmm. like the paradigm John was talking about that yeah. he grew up in. And yeah, no, Moses wrote everything and then handed it to us. Right, right. Like, well, God wrote it through Moses. That's right. Yeah. Like, Moses just woke up one day well, and was like, so "Oh, what did Jesus, I write?" Yeah. You know, that kind of yeah, including that's the announcement model. of his death and how <laughs> no one would find his body. And, and that correct. Sort of yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, I, if I have had a any kind of tension or crisis is too strong, but I really needed to work out for myself what it means the model of inspiration of mm -hmm. a divine words, mm. speaking through texts that were formed, yeah. you know, in, through a fairly complicated, yeah. long-term process. Was that part of the impetus to do that, just kind of looking at the complexity of editors and compilation? Was uh, that, so some was of that, that uh, and a lot of it just actually began, the Dead Sea Scrolls mm -hmm. give us that window yeah. into the state of the biblical text right, a right. couple of years before Jesus, the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. And it's complicated. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. not simple. Yeah. Uh, and then I try to, to constantly just read parallel in New Testament text criticism and canon formation just because I felt like they yeah. illuminated each other. And it's the same thing. You know, those first couple centuries, um, the papyri, and then it's, it's just complicated. The yeah. point is, is, is uh, and it, those complications can be over overcooked and oversold. Mm -hmm. There's a figure like Bart Ehrman yeah, has yeah. made a lot of money right. overcooking. Amazingly. Uh, yes, totally. Yeah. I always tell my students, I'm like, this guy took a very obscure... Yeah. I, I mean, I know we, we're into <laughs> books, yeah. but still, he took a very <laughs> yeah. obscure thing that I think some people find difficult to teach on and made a New York Times bestseller. Yeah. Now, he twisted it, but yeah. it, it is... We, yeah, and he's got Jesus. You know? yeah. <laughs> but, but, but the point is, is what he's... Uh, what he's putting his finger on is people who grow up in a tradition right, like what right. you experienced, John, are yeah. given no preparation. Right, right. And then you go into early Christianity, like 102 yeah. at university, right. and it's just the basic information about right. text criticism yeah. and manuscript history of the Bible, and you it's just shipwreck people's faith. Yes. They have no categories for how it all works together. Yeah. So that was... Um, just for me, that the literary brilliance and genius of this literature, how it works, but then also the historical process of how it was formed, mm. those became really important uh, categories for me, and they've informed. They still inform in a big way how I even think about reading these texts mm. and uh, p part of what we do through the Bible Project. We don't do a ton of that mm -mm. type of stuff, though. You want to do, yeah? Something. Is the historical part still? I mean. You guys have videos on making of the Bible? No. Nope. No? We've, we're, mm. we're talking about Do you have a video a on text criticism? I'm sure that'll get millions of views. Right? Uh, <laughs> no, we don't really. Uh, <laughs> we have one it on the formation of the Tanakh as yeah. a collection yeah. of scrolls. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we, we're toying with uh, some some projects that would invite okay. people into that on yeah. a popular audience. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. 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 Be it's not terrifying. Yeah. It's it nothing, no. there's nothing scandal. No, right. there's not no magical or anything like that. No, it's really actually amazing. Yeah, right. Um, There's no skeletons, all. really. It's just Th it's, that's it's, right. it's just a process. Correct. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, so. Oh. Well, this has been good. Let's uh, take a little break, and then we'll come back and yeah. hear some more. Yeah, deal. My name's Aram, and I'm in the MABTS program at Western Seminary. My favorite part about this program is that I get to study and reflect on God's Word at an academic level, and I also get to learn around some amazing people. The students and faculty here have helped me grow in the way I understand God and His Word, and I also get to do it in an environment that pushes and challenges me both personally and academically. 
Western Seminary offers a number of programs to help students prepare for the work God has called them to through rigorous education designed with practical application. If you're interested in learning more about Western or starting your application, visit us online at westernseminary.edu. Now back to the show. All right, well, welcome back. We are here with uh, Tim and John from the Bible Project, and this is Food Trucks in Babylon. We like to ask mm. what your favorite food trucks are lately or maybe all time, mm. whichever one. Uh, mm. John, yeah. you have one here in the Portland area. Yeah, there's a, a, a Korean fried chicken place uh, cart on 28th and Burnside, that yes. little pod there. Yes, I'm, I'm trying to remember the and name. Shoot, it's a cool I, name. It is. Not Tim, Kim John Grillin? No, no. 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 Yeah, that's a great name, too. Oh, it's... Um, <laughs> What's the term when fear of missing out? Uh, FOMO. It's called FOMO. Oh, it's called That's FOMO. It is. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. it is excellent. I yeah, to, it's really good. I'm old yeah, enough. I, I had like to look that up at one point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Somebody was like FOMO on Instagram. I'm like, I have no idea what that means. Yeah. <laughs> I have to do that all the time. <laughs> Jesus. Yes. Constantly. Jesus. Urban Dictionary. We're getting yeah. old. Yeah, yeah, totally. <clears throat> yeah. That's right. What about you, Tim? Um, let's see. You know, a, a regular on the lunch circuit that John and I walked to oh, a lot. Yeah. I really enjoy a Sherpa kitchen. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's like Himalayan mm. style noodle dishes. Mm-hmm. So nice. Good. They give you like it's warm really good. chai tea to As drink you're while you're waiting in the cold. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, Kim to. John uh, Grillin yeah. is that's amazing, isn't it? Unbelievable. Yeah. These yeah. balls will blow your mind. Yep. I love it. Holy cow! Love there you go. Those are my two tops. Thanks. So we were talking about uh, just like paradigm shifts, how you became who you are, and what how that's. Mm makes its way into the, the work that you do. Um, and we left off with some mm. text text criticism, mm. which, which is an odd sort <laughs> of, you know, it's like, well, I, I went through this period where I was thinking about text criticism and formation of scriptures, but it, yeah. but, but it does have a huge effect on how you read the Bible, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, it, it's about what, what fills your imagination when you think of how these biblical texts were actually produced and written and composed. Most people have some kind of scenario they're filling yep. in to their mind, and the question is, is that how it actually happened? Yeah. So that's more. And I find the understanding how the texts were actually produced, text production in the ancient world and preservation really illuminates how uh, the expectations put on the reader mm. of how mm. to make sense of them. They kind of go hand in hand yeah. with literary design. Like yeah. But I think John... Yeah, so that ways. and that tees up the literary design is is the second paradigm shift so it's very connected the first one being it's Mm. both human and divine and by looking at its humanity i actually see its divinity more clear clearly Mm. that was a big shift for me so then what does that mean to look at its humanity and one of the things one of the tools that tim has equipped me with uh and and people who watch the videos is looking at the literary design of books and now also we're talking more and more about the literary design of smaller literary units mm. than, than an entire scroll, um, wh- wh- whether it be a chapter or mm. what we call chapters, but um, that there is a high degree of sophistication mm. in how these things are, are designed and that through its design, we can then get to what did the author intend to communicate. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they do that through repeated words. Mm. Uh, they do that through um, plot um, and characters and these kind of recurring motifs kind of mm-hmm. it's just a lot of riffing if you think yeah. of like mm-hmm. jazz or something there's just a lot of like yeah. picking up on a melody right um and you're supposed to just know and see it yeah mm-hmm. and um i and i never would yeah in fact if i did see it it would just feel repetitive yeah almost like it was a mistake yeah. like you already told me that yeah or else they couldn't think of anything else to say. <laughs> yeah. Or they have a limited vocabulary. Right. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 But yeah. it turns out these are like really good writers. Yes. Amazingly sophisticated yeah. writers. Yeah. Um, pushing the boundaries of what they could do with the technology of a scroll. Yeah. yeah. And communicating a really grand narrative. Mm. Mm-hmm. And um, that was that mm. was wonderful. And it still is mm. increasingly so wonderful to, to mm. see. Mm. I want to bring up Hurtado again, second time. Mm. But he he mm. talks about how when they crafted these, that there probably was multiple drafts and edits mm. and things like that, just mm. because of the production was so difficult in one way, mm. which m- would make mm. you think maybe they just did one draft and done. Mm. But because they were so important that there's some evidence that 
this these I'm especially yeah. thinking of Paul's epistles right now, yeah, but yeah. be dictated and then read read over and then honed and then yes. talked about more and then yes. sent off after like a lot of care and thought. And that just You'd have to that, imagine. Yeah. That's yeah. just kind of yeah. getting I mean, back to your idea, kind of getting behind the text a little bit to understand the production yeah, was really right. helpful for me to see in terms of yeah, there's, there's a lot of care that goes into themes and language and mm -hmm. word plays. I mm -hmm. mean, man, if you start digging into the mm -hmm. language, yeah. sometimes you begin to see word plays that are just yes. blowing your mind. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. It's, yeah. 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 That's actually kind of a new horizon for me in the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah, the degree of word play, puns. Yep. It's, the technical term is paranomasia. <laughs> oh, nice. But this whole paragraph will be organized word. around <laughs> like the repetition of a few right. sounds or consonants. Yep. And uh, but it's not weird like Bible numerological code. It's just yeah. like really beautiful literary yeah. communication. Yep. Yeah, it's what you expect when yeah. you think of what you could do with language in terms of communication. That's yeah. right. Through yeah. rhyming and That's right. And it's not the way we do it in English. Mm. Right. Um it's it's a it's a different yeah way to do it. One uh, uh, probably for me the forefront of kind of my own research when I'm excited about is the way that literary uh, patterns, repeated words start creating. Uh, we call them design patterns. Mm -hmm. um, different scholars have different names for them, but what we were just talking about pressing the the technology boundary. Mm -hmm. So the just the Hebrew Bible. It's a collection of independent scrolls. Um, it never existed in one codex pre in the Second Temple period. So it's, it's a collection of separate scrolls, mm -hmm. but um, th they are all cross-referencing each other and quoting and linking each other through these patterns in a way that it becomes very clear that over time, the scribes, who I believe the Holy Spirit was guiding to produce all of this, actually viewed all of it as one mm. thing in their minds. Mm. Yeah. But there wasn't a technology available for mm. it all. With a particular yeah. order? A scroll order, perhaps? Um, or, or is well, that as big a deal? Uh, uh, the scroll order, for sure, from Genesis to Second Kings, which okay. is one narrative sequence. Um, and then the rest of the books of, and then the books of the prophets yes. all begin with the first sentence is just one big, like if we were on a web page, it'd be a hyperlink back to some moment yeah. in that narrative sequence. Okay. And then once you get to like the Psalms or Ruth, you just need a couple little cues to hyperlink it into the collection. And then you're off to the races, mm. just working the patterns mm, okay. and the melodies. And so it's one whole thing in the minds of these authors, but it couldn't be contained mm. in any one place. Mm -hmm. And so... That's become really fascinating to me, mm. yeah. the way a collection of scrolls can be unified mm. through hyperlinks and patterns. Even in the way that you have, sh you, the way that you've shown how they're viewing it and the way they hyperlink, you mm. can't even really show that in a codex. Mm. Like, mm. it's, yeah. there's so much layering of yeah, ideas. You need Wikipedia yeah. for that. So you actually, need a type no, of, yeah. no, a yeah. type of yeah. Wikipedia type thing right. yeah. that would start to draw that out. So, uh, you know, an excellent illustration your your recent book on matthew mm -hmm. which i've only been able to prove it's awesome yeah. oh thanks Appreciate um it. Yeah. but so yeah you're in the gospels mm -hmm. and you've got jesus getting baptized mm -hmm. going through the wilderness yep. up to a mountain That's where right. he starts expositing the yep. ten commandments yep. <laughs> and yep. saying how the whole torah is about that's him. right it's all and so what he's doing, that's the end process. Mm -hmm. Patterns, uh, moses patterns like that yep. through the waters wilderness 40 days 40 years um, that already has been happening within the Hebrew Bible itself. That's not a novel thing to the gospel. Right. That's right. right. So the New Testament authors are so into this mm -hmm. that they don't even have to explicitly draw attention to it. They yeah. just assume right. that if you have been reading these texts, you've been trained to read them. Yeah, right. Because you have been brought into the Christian community. That story. <laughs> and where you're learning how to read them. And like, like Pesher or Midrash or, or those sorts of mm. things. I, I think so. I, there's an immense amount of confusion mm -hmm. uh, around how Jews in the Second Temple period read and understood and interpreted their Bible. And my deep hunch is that it's just, it's Western scholars trying to get our minds around what was native to these right. people who lived and grew up on these texts. Yeah. And so we sometimes see it as, you know, when Paul will um, 
quote from, you know, a redeemer will um, come out of Zion. No mm -hmm. quote from, you know, a psalm, a, a psalm or something or from Isaiah 59. But actually he's bridging three different texts from the Hebrew Bible in his mind. He's blending the word together. And if you go back in the Hebrew Bible, they themselves are hyperlinked to each other mm -hmm. through some patterning or connection. And, uh, and they know exactly what they're doing. And they are tracking with patterns that are already there. But because, uh, yeah, whatever, dif different traditions that people happen to be brought up in, we're just not trained to read the Bible that way. And so it looks arbitrary. But we are trained, us. I think, culturally to view media that way. Oh. Ah. So yeah. when I think of mm. film and my favorite movies and my favorite directors and what makes a film work, as right. soon as you start getting geeky about it, you're thinking about That's true. the same types of ideas. That's true. Of, yeah. of what you're... Yeah, of plots and um, motifs. compositions and motifs yeah, and that's right. Um, and then you have a di it's a different medium. It's a visual medium, mm -hmm. but it's the same kind of mm -hmm. things yeah. are at play. You know, I, I'm not a, a music theory scholar at all, but I've been doing a little reason uh, reading uh, on Beethoven scholars, mm -hmm. and actually, this was his thing. Um, he he invented the Beethoven project is next. Yeah, the yeah. Beethoven yeah. project. But apparently, <laughs> like he he invented mechanisms to unify whole symphonies mm -hmm. around just a few chords okay. or a few melodies that he would introduce in the first 60 seconds. And then, mm. and, and uh, so it's interesting to me that it's actually in art yeah. that you find very close analogies to yeah. biblical style. Yeah. I James think Jordan, do you know that name? He's oh, yeah, uh, yes, with yeah, Light, Peter Lightheart. Correct. Yeah. They, and Alistair Roberts, yes. they've used a lot of like, well, they've used some, yeah. probably not a lot of music theory to help train people to interpret the Bible. Yeah, it's very... So I, that's all I have to say about that. I don't know yeah, where else they went with that. Yeah, I'm just kind of beginning yeah. to think about how fruitful yeah. the analogy can be. But so now the, yeah. the, the question would be, there's some people who look at the way the apostles mm. read the, the, the Old Testament, mm. and they would say, because they'd been trained in that, mm. just as a way of life, that we, we are not so... There, that mm. apostolic reading is not available to us other than what mm. they wrote. We can't read the Bible mm. the same way. But I take it you don't agree with that. Mm. You, uh, that seems to be a big part of what the we Bible not. Project's not trying to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I'm just kidding. Well, I think, I think there's, there's a couple versions of that. One is that some people have the view that um, they actually are inspired by the Spirit, the apostles are inspired by the Spirit to discover meaning that was hidden yeah. and unknowable there. Like little Easter and eggs throughout the Old Testament. But there, you know, once you see it, you can't go back, and it, yeah. it's right there. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think I'm trying to help uncover a, a little bit different than that. Um, because somebody like Simeon, in the Gospel of Luke, somebody like Simeon, who's awaiting the redemption of Jerusalem, and mm. what the Holy Spirit told him was, you're going to see the person before you die. Um, the Holy Spirit apparently didn't have to tell him, there's going to be a person, and here's why, and here's why you're waiting for him. Like, he knew all that. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how did he know to be anticipating someone in whom the redemption of Jerusalem would, would come about? And that's what I'm after. How did mm -hmm. someone like Simeon grow up reading the Hebrew scriptures? Um, which he almost certainly didn't, he didn't have them in a book. Mm -hmm. he, he heard them and probably had most of it memorized, mm -hmm. and he had it in his heart. In his yeah. mind, as one big thing. So Another that, way we talk kinda, about that's this. That's kind of, and I think, yeah, we sh we should recover that yeah. as much as we can. Yeah. Yeah. One way you've talked about yeah. this is as it's Jewish meditation literature. Yeah, yeah. Psalm one. Psalm one. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And day so and, it, day and night. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So it seems like you're pushing towards human author, um, mm. not at the expense of the divine author. Correct. But yeah. that you're pushing into these authors know what they're doing so sometimes does it, and I don't, i'm not fishing here i'm just wondering yeah yeah um it almost seems so genius sometimes mm -hmm. yeah when, when when do you think i, I know there's this intermarriage right yeah, <laughs> of the human right. divine author yeah, but right. sometimes i struggle with like is this the divine author coming mm. coming in and just kind of directing mm. but i don't want to have that view of just kind of like forcing okay write this yeah. word yeah, uh, yeah. how much like yeah. Sometimes that intermarriage is difficult for me to... Yeah. yeah you have it's any thoughts on that in terms of... Like some sort of biblical Apollinarianism <laughs> where the divine overwhelms <laughs> the human. Oh, right? wow. No, right. wow. no I'm, not, yeah. I'm not getting there. But you yeah. know what I mean? Like, no, I'm with you. There's, I, a, I there's have, a sense in which yes. it's so amazing sometimes that I'm like, 
I know it. What is it? The human, like, uh, do you have any thoughts about human relationship, human divine author on the, that? Uh, other than just, I, my brain explodes on a regular basis right. reading the Hebrew right. Bible. And, um, I, yeah, I just, embr- the same. It's actually through thinking about Jewish meditation literature and ancient text production that yeah. I, I feel like I meet the voice and presence of the spirit mm-hmm. in these texts. Yeah. And yeah. It all points me to Jesus yeah. <laughs> on a regular basis, and I, that's just been my experience. Right. So, right. yeah, it, it's actually focusing on yeah this these literary strategies mm-hmm. and ancient c- cultural styles of communication that gets yeah. for me it's the gateway. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I, I know until you somebody can get more native to the Bible and how it works, it sounds a little crazy, <laughs> 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 or it sounds like a you know right. Uh, like you want to fill it out theoretically, but um, mm-hmm. I think what I have found, especially with students, is once you can just get th- get them into the story, yeah. they can see how it works, yeah. and then they start having their own yeah, yeah. discoveries yeah. Right. of how it all works well, together, and then you can just just yeah. let the Bible do its work exactly. on people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we just filmed an intro to the Hebrew Bible class, yeah, and um, so we had six students that Tim walked through a lot of the stuff with, and you can see the discomfort at first and the kind of just bewilderment. Mm -hmm. And then once you started reading through actual texts, texts, just minds being blown and just this awe and just excitement, this just raw energy of just like, Oh my goodness, this is my Bible. (laughs) Yeah. And, um, yeah. And you just saw that happen in real time. It was cool. It is cool. That's (laughs) awesome. Yeah. Well, any other paradigm shifts that you had? Um, I know you have more. <laughs> well, the, well, the, other the third one up? we like to talk about is that mm. the Bible is a cosmic drama. It's one s- cosmic story that Jesus sees himself as fulfilling. So it's a, it's a, un- and it's a unified. It's a unified story that leads to Jesus. Is kind of a tagline at the Bible Project. By cosmic, what do you mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, the entire universe. Universe, yeah. yeah. Cosmos mm. of, of <laughs> um, the heavens and the earth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And. Uh, and what God is doing in the mm-hmm. universe, specifically through humanity, these dirt creatures mm-hmm. uh, that he has given his image to, um, that whole drama um, that then gets, you know, specifically about the family of Abraham, but um, Jesus sees himself as being the fulfillment of that. And so, and what, what we don't mean by that is you can go back into any story and then find, oh, that's, this is talking about Jesus and this is talking about Jesus, but that all of these themes and motifs and ideas and the whole plot of the Hebrew scriptures is mm. all finds its climax and resolution in Jesus and new creation. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's kind of a structural paradigm for us. Yeah. yeah. It seems like the yeah. other two kind of lead towards that one in mm. some sense, right? Foundation mm-hmm. for yeah, that's right. reading it as yeah. kind of that unified drama. Yeah. Cosmic drama. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But not, not your average like story. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. Right. You don't just go from Genesis to Revelation, no. and yep. it's a single. Yep. You know, like the classic plot arc. Yeah, uh, it's it's cycling. Right. It's like a symphony, right. more like a symphony. Yeah. Yeah. And by the time you get to the end, you're overwhelmed because mm-hmm. you've actually gone through right. a climax resolution about two hundred times. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Did you listen to that on script podcast about the Bible as poetry or something? Do you remember that one? Um, I don't remember. Oh, who it you was. know, uh, I'm behind on, on script okay. right now. Okay. I'm behind. There was on one that was really interesting right where he was just pushing against the narrative. Mm. Interesting and saying yeah. it's poetry. Ah, uh, and uh, trying. He actually. Yeah. I think he was trying. Po- to be poetic perfect. or poet. Poetry. Yeah, I guess po- poetic. I see. Got it. He thinks it makes more Non-l- sense to view it as yeah. almost a large. Yeah, I don't remember. Maybe po- a poem. Yeah. But I think what he was trying to do, he was pushing. Felt like he was pushing too hard. He was just saying you see different things if you put kind of that yeah, poetic yeah. lens over it that well, you won't see if you just do narrative. Which one, one shortcoming of trying to summarize the storyline of the Bible in like five things yep. is just that. Yep. Um, mm. So you go, you know, from creation, fall. Yep. yep. Uh, hopefully yes. you have an Abraham or Israel movement in there, yeah. maybe an exile. Um but then you're off to the prophets and the new yep. creation. And you're like, but what happened to the wisdom literature? Right, right, right. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, and what happened to Ezra and Nehemiah? That's right. And like, those yeah. are really important yep. contributions. Yep. And so it's much more, Scott McKnight uses um, the phrase wiki stories. Mm-hmm. 
So like the book of Ruth right. is like almost a mini yeah, yeah. reenactment true. of the That's whole good. drama in a one little mini story. Yeah. And it, yeah. it's more like that. Yep. A collection of wiki stories. Biblical theology, yeah. I mean, term in the realm we're in, biblical theology, kind of yes. narrative scripture. Yes. I always tell my students it's really fun to do, but it's also dangerous in one sense mm. because you're kind of choosing, uh, hopefully you're letting the biblical authors choose, but you're also choosing which themes to highlight mm-hmm. and which themes not to highlight yep. yeah, certain retellings. Right. Yeah, that's right. Well, yeah, that's, uh, and that's what we do. <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, right, but it's, it's hard. Yeah, it is hard. Yeah. Sometimes different biblical yeah. theologies will run into one another. Yeah. And, and Those are the hardest videos for us to write, too, when we try right. to isolate one theme. Yeah. It's and helpful it, to just isolate it is, a theme. It is. And you can do it. And, and you see the through. scriptural authors, I think, doing yep. it. But there's a complexity there, there as well and yes. a paradox to scripture that you... And you can kill yep. the butterfly. That's really right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Agreed. Probably the, the question that we get the most about mm. uh, about Bible Project and what we thought of what was written was the mm. Gospel Coalition's uh, critique of your atonement. Mm. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. How have you thought thought through that uh, mm. uh, mm-hmm. yeah i gave i gave a lot richard he's a pastor in uh, mm. yeah i, didn't I forget what city it. in Aus- australia australia yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah I, 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 there were a few a few pieces to it one was it was a it was a thoughtful essay um he he had gone through um a number of my old sermons that were relevant two in particular that were done quite a few years ago and he had excerpted some quotes this from your time like in wisconsin when i was in wisconsin yeah, yeah okay. one and then one was pastor in portland um and so you know sermons uh, i tend more towards lecture style sermons that's just kind of my style i think it maybe is a weak weak point in whatever um that's more my style but um in in both of those messages one is he quoted from I had noticed a pattern in both churches I was a part of, and it was it was a really distorted view of the Trinity that um, mm-hmm. Jesus is saving us from like yeah. from God. Yeah. He saves us from God Fr- from God or like, like from the Father, God the Father in particular. Mm-hmm. Correct, okay. but yeah. that's right. Um, and I, I'll never forget a Kinda woman like the wrathful, sitting on wrathful my, God and loving Jesus. C- correct. So yeah. yeah, this woman was sitting on my couch at a small group one night, and she's you know, portraying her Bible in two parts, and there's the God hates me part, and then there's the Jesus saves me from the God who wants to kill me. And I, I can't tell you what a constant drumbeat this was in both churches that I was a part of. So those were the context into which I gave ser- sermons about the meaning of Jesus' death and mm. the relationship of God's justice and his mercy, mm-hmm. and I thought they were balanced. <laughs> <laughs> I think Richard disagreed. Um, but then he went um, and was surveying different vi- Bible Project videos, yes. um, and so that, and that's fine. Um, but it's true, like in our Romans one through four video, my portrayal I'm and continue to be really struck by the depiction of God's wrath. Romans one sixteen and seventeen, mm-hmm. the wrath of God is revealed against all who suppress the okay, truth so and righteousness. S- so you do believe in the wrath of God. Well, yes. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to give you the chance oh, to okay. say it right there. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I don't know how you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. 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 God's angry at mm-hmm. what humans have done to each other and to His world. The question is, what is He doing with that anger? Yeah. And how does He express it? And Paul expresses it in Romans one through four through the triple repeated, and He handed them over. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what I was cluing into the video. So we depict humans in trapping themselves, God allowing people to trap themselves. And so we show humans in ch- chains to death and sin. Um, and he, w- I guess uh, Richard felt like we should have used the lang- actual language of God, God's wrath, yep. handing people over mm-hmm. to their sin. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I and then he went through some other videos like um, in the prophets and uh, he noticed the absence or what he thought was the downplaying of wrath language in some places and, um, I don't like one in the book of Nahum. He noted uh, wrath, the vocabulary of wrath appears a lot in Nahum 1. And I didn't use the word, but the whole picture was of, fair, of a like the king of Assyria's head getting exploded by a bolt of divine lightning. Mm. But I don't know. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, picture picture has a thousand so, words. So <laughs> yeah. So uh, I he, but here I think the substance of his argument, what he was nervous was that we um, were essentially saying that the death of Jesus had nothing to do with God's right. judgment on human yeah. sin. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I I do think the mosaic. Uh, imagery like the, the the cross as like the gem, the multifaceted mm-hmm. gem. The apostles are not bound mm-hmm. to one language scheme when they talk about the cross, but at the heart of it is someone being in our place yeah. on our behalf. Um, so, do you think it was a misunderstanding or difference of interpretation, or I, a little bit of both? I think a little bit of both. Okay, yeah, yeah I think a little yeah. bit of both. Yeah. Um, and I actually. Uh, uh, I went and talked with quite a few friends about the article, and I I can see patterns in my own thinking where I will strategically delay language about divine anger mm. until we've covered some other things about the cross. And I know that there are traditions where ta- divine anger needs to be the foregrounded element yeah, when you're talking the about element. the cross, the yeah, central right. element even. Yeah. So I think that would be an area of difference. Yeah, right, and, and, right. and just to say, th- that's an area of difference because um, I'm... I don't see that pattern in the apostles themselves. Mm-hmm. And actually, I've gone through many times just to make sure I'm not messing this up, but there is not one text in the New Testament where the cross, where the divine attribute of wrath is directly connected in the same sentence as to the meaning of the cross. In other words, the number one divine attribute mm-hmm. highlighted in the New Testament's depiction of this cross, cross is agape. Mm-hmm. Now, wrath fits into a larger narrative about why Jesus needed to die. But to me, it's significant that when the apostles talk about the meaning of the cross, the divine attribute they foreground is God's agape love. Not at the expense of his justice. That's right. But if they want to make sure you remember something about the meaning of the cross, mm-hmm. they want you to walk away <laughs> with agape. Yeah. Um, and and so I, maybe that's the difference of interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah. don't know. I, I'm actually curious what you, yeah. how you guys process that. Well, I that. think that there's that. I, I, I would... Just to, to to maybe repeat what you just said, that there is a a, a background of God's anger at sin. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. And and so so why the cross? It, uh, it's it is certainly a demonstration of God's holiness, but it's yes. motivated by His love. That's right. If yeah, that's right. I, I mean, yeah. The the easiest way for God just to pour out wrath would be for Him to pour out wrath. Yeah. Um, yeah. And. Yet he does something substitutionary yeah. uh, for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, right. And, and it's it is it is certainly motivated by love. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I, you yeah, know, I'm I'm learning, mm-hmm. and uh, I wanna I wanna represent the apostles the way they want right to represent themselves. Yeah. And so that's yeah. something that we all are on a journey of learning to try and do. Isn't I it? taught First Peter last semester, two mm. semesters ago. Mm. Just looking at some of the Christological paradigms he does, I was struck that he takes that substitute language doesn't i don't think he brings up the wrath language actually at all Mm -mm. but he brings the substitute jesus is kind of the ultimate slave actually Mm. who suffers Mm -hmm. um and and then that provides the example but he's also the substitute and then yeah later on he'll bring up in a very confusing text but kind of the christus victor Mm. um so in in one kind of section of first peter Mm. you have at least three of the models of the atonement Mm. uh, in terms of substitute yeah, moral example, and then he declares victory that's right. as he goes down. And the lamb, the he talks about the blood of the lamb. That's right. In chapter that's one. Right. Yep. So that's yep. a good example. He's got a full yep. palette exactly of images to and talk about the cross. He uses all of them in different yeah, ways right. and can go in and out of them. Yeah. I think sometimes we yeah want to have kind of this neat little package of you can only talk about this one here and there, but yeah. it seems like all of them inform one another. Yeah, kind of that. Cl- kaleidoscopic yeah. view. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. The the text I was thinking about um you know it's a it's a difficult text Romans 3:25 that God presented him as a mm-hmm. yeah. asterion. <coughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, the mm-hmm. atoning sacrifice or mm. some old translations would go between propitiation or expiation. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, or yeah. the very old interpretation yeah. that is Getting more champions recently is Mercies. is the the covenant the, uh, the lid yeah. of the he is yeah. the place yes. in which yeah. sins are dealt with right the mercy seat the mercy seat yeah, yeah. that was the yeah. other one I was going to bring up yeah, so right. as you interpret that verse just um, yeah do you have any thoughts about that in terms of what, what is that if you take it as atoning mm-hmm. sacrifice mm-hmm. 
It, mm-hmm. Is there a wrath kind mm. of idea in there? Mm. First mercy seat. Mm. Um, oh man, you know, yeah. I, I don't have actually a pad answer for that either. So yep. I'm, I'm yep. kind of yep. fishing here. But you know, actually, about I, that? I um, I've become uh, really uh, convinced that the place we ought to go and where Paul is explicitly working out the divine attributes in relation to the cross is Romans eight one through four, mm. where he talks about God. Pun- condemning sin, sin. Uh, by giving up his son as a sin offering mm-hmm. so that he might condemn yeah. sin yeah. in the flesh of Jesus. Right. Right. But, uh, but his language there is not quite like, again, the language of like this woman sitting on my right. couch who right. would tell me about a song about Jesus bearing the wrath of the Father. Mm. And it seems to me Paul would say, no, sin is mm. being condemned by God's anger there. Yeah. Um, Paul doesn't mention God's wrath, but it's interesting. He talks about sin sure. is the object mm. of God's yes. mm. judgment. Yeah. So at the cross, in, it, Christ, we're, we're told by Paul, yeah, becomes yeah. sin, right? He, yes. He, yeah, he that's who right. knew no sin became sin yeah, on yeah, our that's behalf. Right. That's so what's right. the re- yeah? That's my question. Though, what's the relationship between <laughs> Christ becoming sin? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean, like, yeah. But so that, if, in my mind, that's still sin, we're still a far cry. No, I, from language get, about Jesus certainly yeah. uh, bearing the anger. Of right. God, there right. actually isn't a biblical text. Yeah, was that was says God that angry at Jesus <laughs> as he was yeah. dying? Yeah, um, yeah, and yeah. And uh, yeah, Paul says very clearly, and mm-hmm. when he activates the Abraham and Isaac story in mm-hmm. Romans eight, that he did not withhold yeah. his only son. That's right, as an yep. act of agape love. Yeah, and that, and that's just I, I, what I'm more concerned about is. I want to imitate the language of the apostles and yeah. what they are trying to get across, but also what people hear. Yeah. What people hear is r- important to me. <laughs> right. And there's a systematic <laughs> side to this too that yeah. you have to be careful with. Yeah. This, the father and the son becoming separate. Oh, yeah. sure. That yes. That is very dangerous even when yes. people talk about. Todd, you probably know a lot forsa- more about that. The forsakenness yes. on the cross of mm, Jesus. Yeah. You have to be really careful mm. like that. God, fa- the Father is just like okay, I'm c- completely apart from you. Mm. Yeah. Then you're up a creek in terms of Trinitarian doctrine and the yeah. unity of the That's Father, Son, and the Spirit. Correct. Now there's different yeah. economies. All of the divine actions. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So it's another yeah, the, piece that it, you have to throw in that, to make it more complicated. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. But but a nice boundary though for our discussion. Mm. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. You know, that's because right. We can't. Uh, mm. So you know, the, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are are different persons. Mm. Whatever exactly that means. Right, um, and there, you know, and there is a uh, there's a continuity of action. Yeah, though, right. That's the, right. The, there's there there is one being there. It, God took care of sin at the cross. Uh, um, we're not saying that the Father died, right? We can't use that language mm-hmm. uh, because the, it was the Son who died. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but it was not um, God against God against God. Right. So to speak, that's it right. was God dealing yes. with sin in yeah, its right. fullness and totality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah ag- agreed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, however, different traditions, yeah. church traditions have developed in, you know, highlighting, foregrounding different things. And uh, yeah. I, I think, yeah, I, I still continue to be amazed at how the apostles can't find enough different ways to talk mm-hmm. about yeah. the meaning of the cross. Yeah. And in ways that were shocking and I think still are. Uh, as the ultimate act of exaltation yeah, yeah. <laughs> and glory and honor or love, mm. things that would have struck no one who was standing there watching Jesus die. Yeah. Um, it was apocalyptic in that yeah. sense, you know. Uh, mm. Well, you guys have done a great job of um, k- kind of avoiding, I, I don't know how to put this, but kind of walking with the scriptures and not trying to bring a lot of tradition into it. Now, obviously, you, mm. you have to bring some yeah. tradition into it. But just in terms of debates, been very impressed with how you've walked through different tough issues. I mean, mm. the millennial issue, you know, everyone is interesting, I haven't interested seen that. in how you haven't do that. I haven't seen that Calvinist uh, versus Arminian yeah, yeah, uh, right. Bible <laughs> project video. Good, though. Yeah. I, yeah. I appreciate that because it kind of unifies people around the Bible, which I think so honestly too. would be part of yeah. what we're doing here at Western and mm-hmm. one of our values as well. And mm. just to see people come around the Bible from different traditions and say, like, we value this as yep. the scriptures. So yep. that's been really great and helpful. Appreciate you all doing that. Yeah, a lot of that comes from, that all comes from Tim's brain, mm. I think. And your, and your, I think desire to um, find unity and to to allow people 
from different spectrums, mm. right? Kind of see where they mm. agree, mm. and then even feel like, well, if we, you know, you can you can teach through a book, and you can have an Arminian going like, yep, yep, and that's why I believe, yeah, you know, <laughs> that's right, right. Uh, the way I believe, and then yeah. a Calvinist doing the exact right, same thing, exactly. Yeah, yeah. for um, me, that's the win. That's the win. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody looks and is like, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which is actually, yeah, yeah, and it's really remarkable how uh-huh. how yeah. that, that can be done. And we have had very little pushback for some reason. Penal s- substitutionary atonement yeah. Yeah. as being a hot issue. Mm. Yeah, um, and I. I f- and I don't know exactly why. I, I think my, one of my hunches is that um, and, and it's from my church tradition, my spiritual tradition, that you kind of, the whole point is to know the right things to then go to the right place. Yeah, yeah. And if that's the paradigm, then um, what's, what's the central right thing to believe? And the central right, right. thing to believe in that tradition is... Um, is that God dealt with my sin on the cross, right? And so you have to know it exactly right. Yeah. And, um, and there's kind of don't get the wrath thing wrong. Mm. We we had a discussion about gospel, I think, right before you guys like published yours with NT mm. right mm. with NT mm. right. Mm. Oh, I think it's linked. Penal substitution is linked to. Mm. Sometimes we narrow the gospel language, mm. Evangelion, yes. to that's that. That's what we mean. That point. Yep. That's what we mean. Yeah. And so then, if you. Ne- Mm. If mm. someone thinks you're neglecting that point, then are you neglecting the, then gospel? Neglecting the gospel? And then, and then, the then that's falling apart. Yeah, it's all. It's yeah, all. Right. But it comes yeah. back to, you know, yeah. how do you? What, what is the gospel? Yeah. How do the gospels define the gospel? How does the Old Testament? How does Isaiah? Yeah. So forth and so on. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, we really appreciate you guys coming by. Yeah, and totally. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, with us. we'll have yeah, to do great it great session again. That was really if we fun. can ever get you up here again, we'll see if we can. But yeah, no, awesome. Appreciate it. Yeah, totally. Yes. Yeah, thank you. We enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to Food Trucks in Babylon. The music you hear is provided by our friends at Humble Beast Records. If you like the show, please leave us a review and feel free to subscribe. To learn more about Western Seminary, visit us at westernseminary.edu. 